Hi. Thanks for coming. Um, I'd like to start out by thanking the Handels and the Greenspan Trust, Dr. Conklin and the DCC Foundation for their support of the Endowed Chair in Genocide and Holocaust Studies. This summer I traveled to Europe with Dr. Werner Steger and 12 students. We visited three countries and eight Holocaust sites. Uh, uh, sites. My students were filming a documentary about Werner's Holocaust Study Abroad course, a course that he developed as the Endowed Chair for Holocaust and Genocide here at Duchess. It was a tough trip. We started in Munich, learning about the White Rose, the resistance group at the University of Munich, then Nuremberg, Dachau, Terezin, and Lidice, a little town that was wiped off the map by the Nazis. We followed the progression of the Nazis from propaganda to t concentration camps to extermination camps, and the hardest part of the trip was the knowledge that no matter how horrific the stories that we were learning uh, from the past, at each location, the next stop was gonna be worse. Uh, we ended the trip at the Auschwitz Memorial outside Krakow, Poland. The whole time I was traveling, all I could think about was why didn't America save these people? Why didn't FDR allow them to come to the United States? Before World War II, there were 16.7 million Jews uh, on Earth. Today, there are less than 14 million. Six million Jews are in Israel, 5.4 million are in the United States. 2.56 million in Tel Aviv, 1.97 million in New York City. 655,000 in Haifa, 621,000 in Los Angeles, 570,000 in Jerusalem, and 514,000 in Florida. So United States really has mirrored Israel as a homeland for the Jews. As we were traveling, I spent a lot of time wondering what America would be like if the six million Jews that were murdered had survived and had emigrated here. Uh, where would they be now? How would they alter the social and political atmosphere in the United States 75 years later? Of course, I have the luxury to speculate about what could have been and uh, what, what, what the world would be like now had, had these atrocities not, not happened because I'm a screenwriter. Uh, Dr. Brightman, on the other hand, has done the history and uh, the research and um, he, he understands Roosevelt's uh, decision-making process. So uh, it's time to listen to him. Uh, Dr. Richard Brightman. Thank you very much, uh, Dana. Uh, I'd also like to thank the Greenspan Trust and the Handel Family Foundation. Uh, I'd like to thank Dr. Conklin for giving so much attention to the Holocaust. And I'd like to give a special thank to Robert Clark of the Roosevelt Library, who, without whom uh, this book would not have been as good. Franklin Delano Roosevelt received approximately 90% of the Jewish vote in four presidential elections, 90%. And yet, today, his reputation in the Jewish community is at best mixed. We need to think about how that happened. After his death, Many Jews deeply mourned, some cried. In the 1950s, Roosevelt remained a beloved figure among American Jews. It wasn't until sometime in the 1960s that the critics began to raise louder and louder voices. Part of this was an outgrowth of greater attention being paid to the Holocaust itself and uh, the field of Holocaust studies emerging. Some of it was uh, the result of specific books uh, looking at the role of the United States during the Holocaust. Probably the first one uh, to make a splash was a book by a journalist, Arthur Morris, called While Six Million Died. But among academics, the man who um, really raised the first loud criticism was uh, David Wyman. There were others, Henry Feingold, uh, who followed. Some of this was judgment in context, and some of it was judgment outside of context. 
as the field developed, there was more and more specialized information about the Holocaust itself, and one could write an entire book about the flow of information. I've done one. Uh, regarding the Holocaust, the reaction of the State Department uh, regarding the Holocaust, and some of that uh, literature and some of those conclusions left its mark on the reputation of Franklin Roosevelt. By the time David Wyman wrote his 1984 book, The Abandonment of the Jews, Wyman judged the failure to react to the Holocaust to be the worst failure of Franklin Roosevelt's presidency, and he left the clear impression that Roosevelt was not only morally culpable, but almost criminally negligent in his handling of the subject. This literature was a little too detached from the context. What do I mean by the context? I mean, Franklin Roosevelt did not have the luxury of dealing with the Holocaust as an issue by itself. He had to deal with the war and all of the issues of the war, including what we later call the Holocaust. Wyman's strong language about Roosevelt seeped down to many millions of people some of whom came up with even simpler explanations. Roosevelt didn't care. Roosevelt was an anti-Semite. I'll tell you a story. I got, after our book appeared and got some publicity, I got an email from someone who I think was quite sincere. He said he had from an unimpeachable source the story that Franklin Roosevelt had all of the information about the extermination camps, including photographs, in 1943 and chose to do nothing. I pointed out to him that it would be impossible for anyone in the United States to have photographs of extermination camps in 1943 and even when American planes flew in over Silesia in the second half of 1944 and took reconnaissance photos, nobody at the time identified the gas chambers and the crematoria, let alone gave them to the President of the United States. In fact, the photo reconnaissance specialist for the CIA wrote an article in a historical journal about why the photo analysts during World War II failed to identify Auschwitz-Birkenau as an extermination camp. So um, let's try to see things a little more as Franklin Roosevelt saw them. I'm going to try in this lecture to do something that I did to some extent, but not completely in uh, one of the chapters of this book, um, to put things in chronological order in order to give you a sense of how Franklin Roosevelt experienced interrelated events uh, week by week, sometimes day uh, by day. If I lose you, you can ask questions afterwards, but I'm going to take the risk. I'll start with information about the Holocaust, but then I'm going to shift to show you how things complicated Roosevelt's job. In the end, Alan and I both came to the conclusion that Franklin Roosevelt could have done more and to some extent, should have done more uh, in speaking out against the Holocaust. But it's not such a simple matter as I think you will see. Information about the Holocaust 
began to leak out of Europe almost as soon as the events began, which is to say uh, during the second half of 1941. But during the summer of 1942, uh, there was a qualitative change. The numbers of Jews killed or said to have died uh, amounted to hundreds of thousands, not thousands here, thousands there. And then in August 1942 came a now famous telegram from Gerhard Riegner, representative of the World Jewish Congress in Switzerland. Riegner had heard from an impeccable German source that Hitler's headquarters was considering a plan to murder three and a half to four million Jews by poison gas, uh, a gas identified as being based on prussic acid. Riegner wanted to alert the World Jewish Congress heads in Britain and in the United States, and of course, he wanted the American and British governments to do something about this horrendous possibility. Of course, we know today that that plan was already well underway. Riegner's telegram went through diplomatic channels because they were quicker and safer to London and to Washington. The telegram reached the Foreign Office in London. Foreign Office officials were skeptical to say the least, but they had a problem. The head of the British section of the World Jewish Congress was Sidney Silverman, who was a member of parliament. A Foreign Office bureaucrat could get in trouble withholding a message to a member of parliament. So Silverman got the telegram. The telegram came to the State Department in Washington. State Department officials, in effect, said they didn't believe it, and there wasn't anything they could do, even if it turned out to be true. So they decided not to pass the telegram on to its intended recipient, Rabbi Stephen Wise, head of the American Jewish Congress in New York. But Silverman took the precaution of sending via snail mail the telegram to Wise. And so Wise got Riegner's telegram, but nearly a month later. What did he do? He rushed down to Washington because he wanted the government to know about it and to react to it. He met with the number two man in the State Department, Under Secretary Sumner Wells. Wells was not only the number two man and in some respects more powerful than the Secretary of State, Cordell Hull, Wells was Roosevelt's man in the State Department. When Roosevelt wanted something from the State Department, he went to Wells. And when we don't have direct information about Franklin Roosevelt's thoughts and actions, we can at least approximately use Sumner Wells as a kind of proxy. Wells told Wise, he didn't believe the report. Why would the Nazis be trying to kill three and a half to four million Jews when they were desperately short of labor and, in fact, using slave labor? It didn't make any sense. Wise said, can I tell my people that we can be reassured? And Wells said, who can tell when you're dealing with that madman, meaning Hitler. So Wells asked for time to investigate, not knowing that his own subordinates 
had already sat on the message for nearly a month. He did, in fact, launch an investigation. He asked American diplomats in Switzerland to meet with Riegner again, with other Jewish leaders there, with refugees, with any credible sources, and compile a report. He also asked the American envoy to the Vatican, Myron Taylor, to see if he could get information out of the Vatican, which, by the way, was not particularly helpful. Leland Harrison, the American minister in Switzerland, ultimately met with Riegner on October 22nd, got more details, including the name of Riegner's secret German source. And two days later, he wrote Wells about the results. Taylor returned to the United States, met with Roosevelt on October 16th. It seems to be a brief meeting, but followed up with a detailed letter on October 20th about his unsuccessful efforts to get information from the Vatican and get a denunciation of Nazi atrocities from the Pope. He said if Roosevelt was willing to speak out, he could try again with the Pope. All right, so this gets us into late October. What was Roosevelt doing? On October 21st, Roosevelt met with Rear Admiral Henry Kent Hewitt and Major General George S. Patton, Jr. to discuss the launch of what was called Operation Torch, an invasion of French Algeria and Morocco, with the ultimate goal of controlling North Africa from the Atlantic to the Red Sea. The most important short-term goal was Tunisia, especially the port of Tunis, because that was a hop, skip, and a jump from Sicily, and that would begin the Allied invasion of the European continent. But even landings in Morocco and Algeria were judged very risky, and Roosevelt had pushed this operation over considerable resistance from the War Department. He wanted American ground troops in action in the calendar year 1942, and nobody believed that the Allies could actually invade France uh, by then. This was an Anglo-American operation. Uh, Roosevelt wanted the Americans in the lead because he thought the French might not fight the United States, whereas they would fight their traditional enemy, Britain. But it was still an Anglo-American operation. And in mid-October 1942, Winston Churchill said, if Operation Torch fails, I am done for. Those were the stakes. Commander-in-Chief of the operation, another familiar name, Dwight D. Eisenhower, years later wrote that the hours he spent in Gibraltar waiting for the start of Operation Torch were his most excruciating hours of the entire war, more so than before D-Day. October 23rd was also the beginning of another key battle on the other side of North Africa, the battle, second battle of El Alamein. If German forces won penetrated deeply into Egypt. They would take the Suez Canal and from there probably move into Palestine, where there were roughly 600,000 Jews. The Nazis had already set up a special force they called an Einsatzkommando. Uh, most specialists call it a mobile killing squad to deal with Jews in Egypt and in Palestine. 
it is worth reminding ourselves that at the beginning of November 1942, the Axis powers still seemed to be winning the war. Roosevelt had wanted Operation Torch to launch before the November elections, another factor he had to take into account, but the military planners could not carry it off, and those elections did not come out well for the administration and the Democrats. Let me shift back to France. Vichy France, the dominant colonial power in Northwest Africa, had enacted discriminatory laws against 330,000 Jews in Morocco, Algeria, and Tunisia. Vichy France in Europe had recently begun deporting Jews, first foreign Jews and then French Jews to the east, an unknown fate. In September 1942, an American diplomat had made a kind of diplomatic protest and was particularly eager to save 4,000 French Jewish children whose parents had gone off in the early deportations. He reported to Washington, the only way to save them was to give them American immigration visas. The State Department proposed 1,000 visas. Roosevelt raised the number to 5,000. But Wells asked Jewish leaders to avoid publicizing this decision. Nonetheless, at a mid-October press conference, a reporter asked the Under Secretary of State, about a recent decision to admit 5,000 Jews to the United States. Wells equivocated. He said, they were of no particular race or nationality, that private organizations were involved, and all of this came about under regular immigration laws and procedures. Nonetheless, there were newspaper articles, and the publicity enraged the premier of Vichy, France, Pierre Laval, who decided that only, only what he called bona fide orphans could leave France. These Jewish children were not bona fide orphans because their parents had merely been resettled to the East. What happened to these children? It is estimated that about 500 of them were smuggled out through Spain and Portugal and eventually arrived in the United States. 500, not 5,000, which shows some of the obstacles even when there was good will uh, behind rescue efforts. I mentioned the elections just before Operation Torch. The Democrats lost 47 seats in the House, nine seats in the Senate. A coalition of Republicans and right-wing Democrats held the balance of power, which meant that Roosevelt had limited influence on some issues. Operation Torch landed in Algeria and Morocco on November 8th. French troops fought, despite American leadership. After days of fighting and substantial Allied casualties, a French leader called a halt, and the fighting in Algeria at least ceased. But by that time, Germany had sent 25,000 troops into Tunisia, where French troops did not resist. And so the Allied goal of reaching Tunisia was in grave danger. General Eisenhower wrote, 
on November 18th. If we don't get to Tunisia quickly, we surrender the initiative, give the Axis time to do as it pleases, encourage all our enemies in the area individually and collectively. The battle is not, repeat, not won. On November 20th, Premier Laval gave a speech in which he hoped for a German victory in the war to prevent communists and Jews from gaining control of France and extinguishing French civilization. Back in Washington, the president had already asked Congress to pass the Third War Powers Act, which happened to contain a provision authorizing the president to suspend laws and regulations hampering the free movement of persons, property, and information in and out of the United States. We don't know why that provision was in there. We do know why it was taken out. The House Ways and Means Committee was worried that FDR would use this clause to open the doors to unrestricted immigration. They stripped it out. Roosevelt tried to persuade House and Senate leaders to restore it in a meeting on Thanksgiving Day. The Speaker of the House declined and Roosevelt backed off. This was the climate, this was the time when Sumner Wills summoned Rabbi Wise back to Washington and said, our investigation now confirms your deepest fears. I'm quoting, for reasons that you will understand, I cannot give these to the press, but there is no reason you should not. It might even help if you did, for reasons that you will understand. Again, think of Wells as a proxy for Roosevelt. The president had plenty of reports from the State Department, from the Office of Strategic Services, the forerunner of the CIA, from the Office of War Information, from the War Department, that all too many Muslims in North Africa saw the Allied forces as fighting a war on behalf of the Jews. That was what Nazi propaganda charged every day. In late November, Assistant Secretary of State Burley wrote in his diary about the situation in North Africa. Only God knows whether the Arab tribes will rise. When General Eisenhower reached Algiers, he found there rumors, widespread rumors, that he himself was Jewish and that he had been sent by the Jew Roosevelt to establish a Jewish state, not in Palestine, but in North Africa. Surely, for reasons you will understand, meant to Wells. The fate of Allied forces in North Africa. Of course, Roosevelt had earlier worried about speaking out boldly on behalf of persecuted European Jews for domestic reasons. His enemies at home, especially those on the far right, thought he was the puppet of American Jews. But now there was an additional reason. Now the Jewish question was very much a factor in the fighting on both sides of North Africa. We think he worried a bit too much at this point, but 
his worries were not imaginary, and it's easier to make a judgment after the fact. So it was not Franklin Roosevelt, but Rabbi Stephen Wise, who held a press conference, publicized Riegner's telegram and other evidence collected to support it, even referring to the fact that the State Department had confirmed the basic story, something which lower level State Department officials then proceeded to deny. The New York Times carried the story on page 10, the Washington Post on page six, the Los Angeles Times, the best of the major American newspapers on this issue, put it on page two. No one thought it was a front page story. It was also in late November that the Polish courier, Jan Karski, surfaced in London with essentially different but basically confirming information, some of which he had seen uh, from a, a short distance away. And his report about killings and gassings of Jews near the extermination camp Belzec began to circulate, putting pressure in London to say something or to do something. So there was pressure in London, there was pressure in Washington. The two governments began to consider some kind of joint or broader statement. On December 5th, the Prime Minister of Canada happened to be visiting the White House. Roosevelt told him he thought the German situation resembled that of 1917, 1918. Germany might crumble at any moment. But Roosevelt had misread the lessons of World War I, which Germany actually lost on the battlefield, even if the collapse came very suddenly. And even as he spoke, hardened German troops counterattacked in Tunisia with the battle dragging on there for months. On December 8th, 1942, the first anniversary of the date of infamy speech about Pearl Harbor, four American Jewish representatives entered the Oval Office about noon. The president sat behind his desk smoking a cigarette. He greeted Rabbi Wise, the only one whom he knew personally. Wise introduced the others, and the Orthodox rabbi present led a brief prayer. Wise presented the accumulated documentary evidence and gave the president the chance to react. He appealed to FDR to bring this to the world's attention and to make an effort to stop it. One of the Jewish partip participants reconstructed this meeting and so we have a fairly detailed account from which I am going to give you selected quotes. Roosevelt said, the government of the United States is very well acquainted with most of the facts you are now bringing to our attention. We have received confirmation from many sources. Representatives of the United States government in Switzerland and other neutral countries have given up proof that confirm the horrors discussed by you. We cannot treat these matters in normal ways. We are dealing with an insane man, Hitler, and the group surrounds him they represent an example of a national psychopathic case. We cannot act toward them by normal means. That is why the problem is very difficult. It is not in the best interest of the allied cause to make it appear that the entire German people are murderers or are in agreement with what Hitler is doing. 
There must be in Germany elements now thoroughly subdued, but who at the proper time will rise up and protest against the atrocities, against the whole Hitler system. So that was Roosevelt's reaction. That was Roosevelt's unwillingness to take a personal stand. He did say that he would release another statement and undoubtedly had in mind the statement already being negotiated with the British. And a larger collection of allied governments, in fact, came out with a statement on December 17th, 1942, recognizing officially for the first time that Nazi Germany had a policy of exterminating the Jer Jewish people of Europe. But let me return to the rest of this reconstructed transcript. Roosevelt asked for other suggestions. One of the Jewish representatives said, what about asking neutral countries to intervene with Germany? There weren't any great ideas about what could be done. Roosevelt then shifted the discussion to North Africa. He mentioned that he had given orders to free Jews in North Africa from concentration camps there, there were some, and to abolish Vichy France's special laws against Jews. He then said that Vichy France had also discriminated against Muslims. And there were 17 million Muslims and only about a million Jews. The United States, he said, was in favor of equal rights for all. It was not in favor of greater rights for one group over another. Some Holocaust scholars have looked at this portion of the conversation and said, in effect, he was leading them away from the focus of the meeting. Actually, he was telling us what was foremost on his mind, North Africa. So one doesn't have to see Franklin Roosevelt as completely indifferent or anti-Semitic when one considers why he did not speak out in late 1942. I think it is better to see him as a juggler who had just taken on a new and very difficult task, the invasion of North Africa, and was worried about the consequences of failure. So does this make Roosevelt a bystander to the Holocaust? Not with allied troops fighting to bring the Holocaust to a halt. And are we going to judge by intentions or by results? Because if we're judging by results, we need to keep in mind that second battle of El Alamein. The British won the second battle of El Alamein in part because Franklin Roosevelt diverted a shipment, actually two shipments since one of them uh, was on a ship that sank, a shipment of Sherman tanks which helped uh, General Montgomery ward off General Rommel at El Alamein and in the process helped save 600,000 Jews in Palestine. Was that Roosevelt's intention? We have no evidence. All we know is that he was aware of the threat to the Jews of Palestine. So 
the category of bystander does not really work very well in this instance, even if Alan and I both think that Roosevelt could have said more publicly about the Holocaust at the end of 1942 and in 1943. Thank you very much. There are usually questions on this topic, and I'll be happy to do my best to respond to them. This area, which might be a little biased, but you say outside of this area that there's a perception that uh, Roosevelt was a bystander or not. Uh, when we wrote this book, we were both of the view that the majority opinion, certainly in the American Jewish community and to some extent in the public at large, uh, was very negative on Roosevelt's handling of the Holocaust. It's not to say that the American public is very negative about Roosevelt in general. Uh, I think he's still regarded in polls as one of the, you know, the top five presidents in history and uh, American historians and political scientists generally rate him in the top three. But there has always been uh, a more negative view since the 1960s of his handling of the Holocaust. Even if Roosevelt had wanted to open up the United States to greater immigration from Europe during the late 30s and early 40s, was the climate in the United States not so opposed to that that it would have been virtually impossible for him to do that? Um, you're, you're doing what I have urged that we do, which is to look at a president and a political uh, leadership in context. And the context was that a large minority of the American public had negative stereotypes of Jews and thought that American Jews held too much power. In Congress, well, uh, let's be generous and say Congress was a reflection of the American public. Uh, there were some anti-Semitic representatives and senators, uh, and um, they may not have represented the majority in Congress, but they certainly were loud and uh, created uh, a great deal of difficulty for any pro-immigration, pro refugee initiatives. So that's generally um, the context. I, we have, um, the, there are two issues that come up in, in almost every gathering, uh, and uh, I, I can predict that they will come up here. One of them I'll leave for you. The other one I'll say is the story of the ship, the St. Louis. And because that particular story uh, illustrates what you're uh, talking about, and because we have a great deal of new information about the St. Louis, uh, let me take about two minutes and give you a very short version of that. People, uh, okay, uh, let's, let's do a test. What happened to the SS St. Louis, those of you who know the story? Sent back to where? You got it right. Most people say it was sent back to Germany. Many people say those passengers went straight to the concentration camps. Some say straight to the extermination camps. Here's the real story of the St. Louis. Two days after the Nazi pogrom called Kristallnacht, the Night of Broken Glass, Franklin Roosevelt met in the White House with the, I'm putting quotation marks around this term, the noted humanitarian 
Fulgencio Batista, the strong man of Cuba. Batista was in the United States to improve his image and to get a reduction of the American tariff on Cuban sugar. Somebody, whether it was Roosevelt or Wells or someone else, said something to Batista because he, he went from Washington to New York where he gave a speech in which he said he would be very pleased to cooperate with President Roosevelt in his effort to do something about the terrible plight of refugees from Central Europe. From November 1938 until May 1939, ship after ship left German ports taking Jewish refugees to Cuba, most of them being given tourist visas, which were supposed to be good for short-term visits. But the Cuban authorities had, in effect, winked and said, if you can support them, we're not going to complain about tourists staying for a long time. Most of those people were on a very long waiting list for American immigration visas. The quota was then filled. It was a substantial quota, but it was filled. If they had to wait in Germany, who knew what would happen to them? But if they could wait in Cuba, it could be three, four years, but they could get into the United States because they kept their spot on the waiting list. That was fine until the St. Louis sailed because by then there was a backlash in Cuba and Batista was not yet dictator. The president of Cuba, responding to anti-Semites, decided to change the policy with regard to tourist visas. So the ship was turned away. It sailed along the coast of Florida. Some people think the Coast Guard began tracking them because it was trying to prevent them from landing in the United States. The Coast Guard had no such orders, and let me tell you something. There was then no such thing as political asylum that came in in the 1950s. Those people couldn't get into the United States because they had no American visas. That was the whole point of going to Cuba. The Coast Guard continued following that ship because Secretary Morgenthau, who was Jewish, asked the Coast Guard commander to do so and said specifically, there are negotiations underway. We need to tell the ship where to go, but don't tell anybody that I'm involved because he was a Jew. So the negotiations in Cuba failed. The negotiations in Europe succeeded. Britain, France, the Netherlands, Belgium took in all of the remaining passengers. 28 of them had been allowed into Cuba on immigration visas. Not one passenger went back to Germany, let alone to a concentration camp or an extermination camp. And we know today, as the result of uh, painstaking research by Scott uh, Miller and, and uh, Laura Ogilvy, Sarah Ogilvy, uh, that two thirds of the passengers survived. Approximately one third were later snatched up by the Nazis and died one way or another uh, during the Holocaust. So why didn't Franklin Roosevelt do something? Well, first of all, he did, or his administration did something. It was a compromise. He did not want to act illegally at a time when he was trying to get Congress, remember, remember those Southern Democrats, to pass a revision of the Neutrality Acts. He knew that war might come soon. He wanted to have the United States have the ability to aid Britain and France in a war against Nazi Germany. That was to him more important than the fate of 900 plus passengers 
on the St. Louis. And yet, at the time, the passengers who were rescued were profoundly grateful. You had to be clairvoyant to know what was going to happen two years later. Sorry I went on so long, but somebody was going to ask it. Yes. Okay, I'm going to repeat part of that because I, I suspect not all of you could hear it. Uh, that was the second issue that always gets raised. Why didn't the United States and Britain bomb the rail lines to the extermination camps or the gas chambers and crematoria themselves? Here is the situation. Uh, remember that story I told in the beginning? Somebody said in 1943, Roosevelt had all the information, chose to do, and the photographs, and chose to do nothing. We, we couldn't get those photographs until the second half of 1944. We didn't have planes that could fly safely over the area and back until we got an air base at Foggia, Italy. The Allied troops had to move up the Italian peninsula before we had good reach into Silesia. So we're talking the second half of 1944. First of all, by then, most of the Jews uh, who died in the Holocaust had already died. Secondly, the only extermination camp still open then was Auschwitz-Birkenau. And yes, uh, Allied planes did, more or less by accident, take some photographs that took in some of the camp without um, clearly identifying what these buildings were uh, for. Um, were there proposals to bomb the rail lines and gas chambers? Yes. Those proposals went in the United States to a new agency that Roosevelt had created because of the State Department's mishandling of the issues. That was called the War Refugee Board. The head of the War Refugee Board had a problem because when his agency was set up, he was told his job was to save lives without diverting military resources. And now he received proposals to use Allied bombers. They checked out bombing the rail lines and found that the Germans were repairing rail, dam rail line damage within a day, sometimes within hours. So John Pele was not going to ask the War Department for something that was pointless. That was out. Bombing the gas chambers and crematoria was not pointless if it could be done. It would have reduced the, effi the efficiency of Nazi killing. And so Pele rather tentatively passed on this request, which came from various Jewish sources, mostly abroad, but there were some supporters in the United States, to the War Department, and the Assistant Secretary of War, John J. McCloy, very quickly and vehemently said, no, this would delay successful completion of the war. Pele tried a couple of times more as he got more information. He tried again, and one third time, a, th a third time, and got roughly the same answer. We know today that there were American bombers hitting industrial targets in Silesia. And so they could have tried if the War Department had had the will. Alan and I looked very, very hard for any indication 
that this issue reached Roosevelt's desk, and we found none. We think it stopped with McCloy. That's what McCloy's biographer concluded, that it stopped with him. In Britain, the issue reached Churchill. And Churchill wrote a memo to Eden, his foreign secretary, get anything out of the Air Force you can. It certainly made Churchill look good. But nobody followed up. And I'm a skeptic. Uh, Churchill was a historian, not just a statesman. He knew how to create a written record for posterity. So neither country in the end decided to do this, both judging that the most efficient prosecution of the war was the best answer to Nazi killings. Again, I don't agree with that decision. But I don't think Franklin Roosevelt made it, and in that sense, uh, it, it was not you know, something that can be laid directly at his doorstep. Uh, all right, I'm, I'm not handling the recognizing you. Um, I've seen reports or, or um, stories uh, that um, intimated that the State Department during this period, in fact, through 1948, with the whole question of the recognition of Israel, had a significant amount of anti-Semitism, perhaps the same anti-Semitism reflected in the country and elsewhere. And I was wondering what you thought about that and whether it extended to Wells and whether the, 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 the attitudes of the State Department might have also um, affected government policy significantly toward um, the, uh, the Jewish issues in Europe. There's no question that the State Department had some anti-Semites and that State Department policies and uh, procedures adversely affected the, uh, the possibility of refugees coming to the United States and a range of other uh, rescue and relief issues. I, I uh, am not a fan of the State Department in this period. If you're asking specifically about Wells, uh, A, I don't think he was anti-Semitic, and B, um, State Department got worse after Wells was forced to resign. Uh, Wells uh, had relatively good relations with a number of American Jewish leaders. They could usually get his ear and sometimes get his support. And that was one route around the State Department bureaucracy. But uh, State Department policy, uh, as a whole, particularly Assistant Secretary of State Breckinridge Long, who was an old Roosevelt crony, was, was very bad. And Roosevelt was guilty in not cleaning out the State Department. He never had the stomach for it. Um, <laughs> it seems like the, the main failure was permitting immigration and refugees were there any opportunities beyond 1942 in the St. Louis where that could have been revisited or was revisited? And one other question. Um, is there, do you see any parallels between the indifference that happened during World War II and the indifference that happened, say, during Rwanda? Um, well, let's see. Two very uh, complicated, uh, difficult questions, um, sort of in different areas. I guess I'll, I'll start with the second one. Of course, uh, the Holocaust has unique features, but uh, it is one extreme end of genocide. And of course, there are parallels between uh, the Holocaust and other instances of genocide, particularly Rwanda, where so many people were killed in such a short period of time. And, the outside world, by and large, uh, chose uh, not to intervene heavily. Uh, in some ways, it's a worse case than the Holocaust because uh, the Allies during World War II were fighting a war for the survival of Western civilization. And the, 
the argument that you had to subordinate everything to winning the war had some force. Whereas in Rwanda, you're talking about a, uh, a less developed country where the great powers could have intervened with military force without horrendous sacrifice. So that makes it worse morally, I think. Um, all right, on immigration. Uh, in a way, you can't handle immigration with a simple statement because immigration changed so radically over time. In fact, we say that Roosevelt's attitudes and policies changed over time substantially to the point where we said there were four phases of Franklin Roosevelt and the Jews and uh, immigration issues are part of those four different phases. So from 1933 to 1936, it was very difficult for German Jews to get into the United States because of pre-existing restrictions, but also State Department interpretations of regulations. Not the quota law, which had a substantial quota for Germany, but immigration was held way, way below the actual quota. As soon as Roosevelt got reelected re in 1936, a new instruction went out, State Department instruction went out to American diplomats in Germany and elsewhere. And suddenly, immigration jumped up. And by the middle of 1938, the quota was filled. And so the second phase of immigration is actually quite positive, 27,000 plus Germans and Austrians, mostly Jews, were coming into the United States in the period from the middle of 1938 until the start of the war. And it continued during the early part of the war. And then the State Department reversed course and Roosevelt supported them. And the spigot was cut off. And this time the reason was fear of national security. Uh, you look askance, but the climate in the second half of 1940 was roughly, well, mildly like the climate in the United States after September 11th, 2001. Foreigners were suspect, foreigners of any kind. And the State Department ran with it, and Roosevelt supported it. And Jews were not exempt because the story in currency was that the Nazis were coercing Jews to spy uh, with threats against their relatives at home. And so from 1940 until late 1943, you have a very negative uh, policy towards immigration and other relief and rescue issues conducted in the State Department, but with Roosevelt not really intervening. And it was at that point that the Treasury Department came up with the evidence that the State Department had been uh, abysmally handling what we would call Holocaust issues, took the evidence to the President and persuaded, uh, Secretary Morgenthau persuaded the President to establish a new body called the War Refugee Board. So in the last year and a half of the war, we estimate that the War Refugee Board helped to save uh, about 200,000 people, which is not negligible. Uh, where was the world media at this point? Uh, newspapers were still very powerful. Radio reporters were all over the place. There were weekly newsreels in the movie theaters uh, about the war, and yet there seemed to be so little uh, reported. I, I gave you some examples of uh, press treatment of Rabbi Wise's news conference. Uh, that tells you something. Uh, there were too many editors, publishers who were skittish. Some of them were skittish because of uh, um, 
learning after the fact about World War I atrocity stories, which had turned out to be invented, some of them, uh, used as propaganda against Germany. Some of them were skittish because um, the sources of information were either Jewish or Polish, and a lot of people thought the Jews and the Poles had their own agendas, and this was not really reliable. So uh, here and there, you would find a particular reporter or a particular broadcaster who would be more forthright, but they were the exceptions and not the rule. There was a, um, a documentary film series produced by the Office of War Information in the United States, uh, which was shown to the American public and to some of the troops, why we fight. A series of, I think, 12 or 13 films produced from 1942 to 1945, they hardly mention Nazi persecution killings of the Jews. The thinking was apparently that there was too much anti-Semitism for this message to go over well, and it was better for Americans to think that the Nazis were a threat to everyone, to all of Western civilization, and not carrying out a specific campaign against the Jews. Would you mind sharing your uh, techniques of how you would uh, research the private communications that went on that helped you to see what was going on? These are students, after all. We might learn something here. Um, sure. Uh, we um, like to think that we did more intensive research on this topic than anybody had done before. I mean, one of the little techniques was to look at um, the list of people Franklin Roosevelt met with day by day and see what names cropped up again and again and uh, if any of those people, of course we used the Roosevelt Presidential Library, and of course, you know, we used other obvious uh, sources, but the problem with Franklin Roosevelt, I mean, was that he was so secretive. Uh, he didn't generally, most of the time he didn't keep a diary. He didn't write lots of long letters. Um, he didn't allow official cabinet minutes. Uh, he didn't let other people take notes in meetings with him. So you have to look in other people's diaries and in other people's papers, those who met with him, reconstructing meetings with Franklin Roosevelt. And one of the, uh, certainly the single most striking document that um, I found in all of this research was a document in the papers of uh, a man that probably nobody else here has ever heard of except Bob Clark, and he, he only knows because I told him. Uh, uh, a man named Arthur Sweetser. Anyone heard of Arthur Sweetser? Okay, so he was, he was a staff, high-level staff person, the League of Nations. But I turned up some evidence that Roosevelt had a conversation with somebody close to uh, another relatively obscure person. I don't think he's obscure, but most people do, James G. McDonald. And I knew that Sweetser and McDonald were friendly. And we found in Sweetser's papers a six-page reconstruction of a conversation with Franklin Roosevelt in April 1938, in which Roosevelt, uh, Sweetser wanted Roosevelt to say he was going to be friendly or friendlier to the League of Nations. That's what he wanted to hear. What Roosevelt wanted to talk about was his initiatives on refugees. And Roosevelt said he wanted to get all the Jews out of Europe in April 1938. Well, I had never seen anything like that before. And then we searched hard enough and found in the papers of one of the worst anti-Semites in the administration, Joseph Kennedy, if you consider an ambassador part of the administration. 
Joseph Kennedy writing in his papers, Roosevelt dreams of getting all the Jews out of Europe. So we had two confirming sources. Even if he didn't mean it, it's still striking. It suggests what he wanted to do at a particular time because at that time he couldn't do much else in foreign policy and because he thought it was his last term. When he decided to run again and when the war started, things changed and Roosevelt changed. So it's rather complex to make a simple moral judgment of somebody who adapted to circumstances so, so radically. <laughs>